Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ask Allah to send his peace and blessings upon his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we're discussing some of the common mistakes widespread among the Muslims and clarifying uh, their, uh, their error and clarifying what is uh, uh, to be correctly done in those situations. So we're in the chapter of Salah and the common mistakes that are done in Salah. And uh, for the brothers who have been following the lectures, you can see that subhanAllah many things that we sort of uh, may be ignorant of or we take for granted or we've been taught uh, are things that are actually common mistakes. Um, and especially in, in regards to something so essential like salah, which is the first pillar after becoming a Muslim, the most important thing in your life as a Muslim, the first thing that we will be questioned about on Yom Al Qiyamah and we find that we have a lot of shortcomings and sometimes even mistakes and sometimes even things that may invalidate our prayers and either people are ignorant of it or they're careless in their attitude towards it. And this is, should be something very important for a Muslim to be concerned with. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, the first thing that you will be judged upon on Yom Al-Qiyamah is what? Is your salah. And if it is correct, then all of your other deeds will be correct. And if your prayer is deficient, then all of your other deeds will be deficient. So really, if you want to judge how you are as a Muslim, look at your salah. Your salah is reflective of your, uh, your faith, your internal faith in your heart, and it's reflective of your general conduct as a Muslim. And there's many, many aspects and perspectives we can see uh, from that. But that's not our discussion today. So we go back to analyzing uh, or clarifying some of the common mistakes. So today, inshallah, uh, is the point of walking in front of a person praying when they are leading the prayer or praying individually and stepping over the people's necks during Friday prayer. As well, this is a common mistake that we see people, someone is praying and some people either don't know that it's a problem to walk in front of someone praying or they're careless. They know you shouldn't, but they don't see it as a major thing. The person who walks in front of the person who is praying or in front of his barrier earns a sin. So if the imam is praying, you're not allowed to walk in front of the imam. Or if the person is praying individually, because if he's praying individually, he is his own imam. You're not allowed to walk in front of him. Even if he has a barrier, for example, he's praying and the wall is in front of him, or has a chair, or has a pillar, or another person is praying. If you walk in between him and his barrier, you have committed a sin. If the person is praying without a barrier, he has up to the area of uh, 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 the area he prostrates in. So let's say, for example, a person prays and he doesn't put a barrier. You can walk from what is beyond where he prostrates. If you walk within where he's standing and where he prostrates, then you have crossed in front of him. And this is something sinful. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, لَوْ يَعْلَمُ الْمَارُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ الْمُصَلِّي مَاذَا عَلَيْهِ لَكَانَ أَنْ يَقِفَ أَرْبَعِينَ خَيْرًا لَهُ مِنْ أَنْ يَمُرَّ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ He said, if the one who passes in front of a person who is praying knew how much of a sin it was, what burden of sin he bears, it would be better for him to stand for 40 rather than to pass in front of him. So sometimes someone is praying and maybe there's no other way. So you have to wait until he finishes. Some people get frustrated. They can't be bothered waiting. So they just cross in front of you. Wait. He said, if you knew how much of a sin it was to cross, you'd rather wait 40. 40 what? It didn't mention what? 40 days, 40 months, 40 years. Yeah, and he wait 40 seconds sometimes. <laughs> it doesn't take much to wait for the brother to, you know. How much, how long is he going to pray for? Can he, can he pray more than 40 minutes? 
right? For your waiting is a worship. Because you are doing that for the sake of Allah. Because you're resisting committing a sin. Okay, and that's why it's important for a person who's praying to put a barrier so that that way it will make it easier for people to walk around him. Okay. Now, uh, the next part is the Friday prayer, but we'll get to that. There's still one more point that I want to say. We said you're not allowed to walk in front of the Imam. But are you allowed to walk? If the Imam is praying, you're not allowed to walk in front of him. How about the lines behind the Imam? If they're praying in Jama'ah, you're allowed to walk in front of them if there is a need. Let's say, for example, someone's in the middle of the line and his nose starts to bleed. So he wants to catch his nose so he doesn't spill. And he wants to go to the bathroom to wash out his nose. What does he do? Just wait there? He's allowed to pass through. Someone, for example, remembers he doesn't have wudu or he breaks his wudu, he's allowed to pass. If there is a necessity for him to walk through, for example, he's allowed to walk between the, the lines of the ma'mumin, those who are following the imam. But you're not allowed to walk in front of the imam or a person who's praying alone because he is his own imam. Okay? And so that is something I, I'm pretty sure we covered before, the importance of putting a sutra when you pray so that that way... Some people may walk in front of you unknowingly. They, don't, they didn't notice that you're praying. That's why when you put a sutra, then uh, uh, yeah, now a sutra is a barrier or something, a chair, you pray in front of a pole or a wall or something like that. So that way it is clearer to anyone who may not be paying attention that you are praying and they don't yeah, in, uh, uh, incidentally commit a sin. Okay. And the next thing that he said is stepping over people's necks during Friday prayer. And this we see it, subhanAllah so many times. People are sitting, people come early sitting, close, and then a brother comes late, he wants to sit in the front. What does he do? Climbs over people, steps over them. So that because they're sitting, when he's stepping over them, it's like he's climbing over their necks. Right? The Prophet ﷺ forbade this. So those who step over the necks of people during Friday prayer harm the worshippers in addition to their tardiness for the prayer. Yani they, yani it's bad habit. It's rudeness. Now, you, you want your king to pray in the front line? Come early. Some people, wallahi, like a bulldozer. It's like he has some sort of entitlement. Pushes people out of the way. Wallahi, there's a brother. People come early. He comes late, finds a spot. And then when it's time to make the lines for the iqama, he makes sure he gets a spot. The brother that he pushed out of the way doesn't find a spot. has to go sometimes to the back. This is bad form. Bad character, bad habit. Some people, subhanAllah, they have very bad akhlaq. And this Islam teaches us akhlaq. And part of that is to respect people. To respect where they sit. Not to climb over them. It's like, you're not important or more important. I'm somehow entitled. There's no entitlement. No one has precedence over the other. The one who comes early, the one who comes first is most entitled. The only exception to that is the imam. <laughs> Because he has to get to the front. So sometimes he might have to, uh, يعني, but in the most decent way, I need to maybe make space for himself to get to the front uh, if that is required. Some masjids, they've got like a special door for the imam. He comes straight to the, to the mihrab. Uh, so if, if the masjid has that, maybe they should build one here for the for the imam but if not then sometimes he has to walk through the people طيب. the uh, the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is narrated by Abdullah bin Busur he said ja a rajulun yatakhatta riqab al-nas yawm yawm al-jum'a wa an-nabiy sallallahu alaihi wasallam yakhtub fa qala lahu an-nabiy sallallahu alaihi wasallam ijlis faqad adayt a man came and started stepping over people one friday he wants to get to a, to the front wants to get to a close spot Stepping over the people. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, was delivering the sermon. The Prophet وسلم, stopped his sermon and said to him, Sit down, for you have annoyed the people. Of course, the disturbance, you've harmed the people. So sometimes calling out people who do wrong things in the Jum'ah is necessary. Because it teaches everyone a lesson. Because especially when they're doing something public, and if someone says to brother, you shouldn't call out someone who does something wrong. He's doing something public that everyone can see. 
So, sometimes if someone does something public, his rebuke should be public to be a lesson for others. Right? But if someone does a mistake privately that you may see, then you might advise him privately. So stepping over people is prohibited during, يعني, when they're sitting or whatever. The person should sit in the masjid in the first open space unless he sees a clear opening that he can reach. So if you come late, sit wherever there is an available space. If there is a, if there is a, a clear pathway where you're not going to harm anyone, push anyone, annoy anyone, you can. All right, And you should try to fill the gaps. But not by separating between people. Two people are sitting next to each other. You separate, between, you separate them, make space for me, and you disturb them. You discomfort them. It is not allowed. Okay, the next point, not saying the opening takbir when the person enters the prayer while the imam is in ruku'ah. This is what another common mistake. You find sometimes the imam is praying with the jama'ah. And a man comes late, and the imam is in the ruku'ah position. So what does he do? He just goes into ruku' without saying Allahu Akbar. Without making the takbirat al-ihram. Why does he do that? Who can tell me? Huh? Hmm? Uh, he wants to, he doesn't want to waste that split second to stand and say Allahu Akbar because that might be the split second where the imam says Sami Allahu liman hamida and he misses the rak'ah. Right? So he just dives into the ruku'ah straight away. It's not allowed. You have to make takbir til ihram. You have to say Allahu Akbar and then go into the ruku'ah. Now the scholars differed. If you say Allahu Akbar for takbir til ihram, do you need to do another Allahu Akbar to get into the ruku'ah? Some scholars said you should. Some scholars said no, it's enough to do takbir til ihram and then go to ruku'ah straight away without making another takbir. But what's important is the takbir til ihram. To stand, say Allahu Akbar, then go into ruku'ah. So some people, they'll just dive into the court without saying Takbir to Ilham. Takbir to Ilham is the Takbir that makes you inside the prayer. So with that Takbir to Ilham, what happens? You're not in the prayer. Takbir to Ilham opens like the key that opens the Salah. So if you go into the court, you haven't opened the Salah, you're still outside of the Salah. Right? This is a mistake because takbirat al-ihram, the takbir of starting the prayer, is the pillar of the prayer. Thus, it is obligatory for the person to say it while standing. Some people, who he'll, as he's in ruku'ah, say Allah Akbar. No, the takbirat al-ihram must be made while standing, and then either you go straight into ruku'ah, or you make a second takbir for the ruku'ah. Then after that, they should bow with the imam in ruku'ah. The opening takbir suffices so the person does not need to say the takbir for bowing into ruku'ah. But if they begin with the opening takbir and then say takbir for ruku'ah, this is more complete. Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu said, Anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana idha qama ila salah yukabbir hina yaqumu thumma yukabbir hina yarka'a. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood to pray, he would say takbir when he would stand up, when he stood up, and he would say takbir when he bowed. Okay? So how about that brother that wants to save those split seconds to make the rak'ah? What do we say to that brother? Huh? Not only that. I say, brother, what are you worried about? What are you worried about? You're worried about missing the ruku'ah? You're missing, worried about missing the rak'ah? Don't stress. What's the big deal if you miss the rak'ah? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said, Tuha, come to the prayer. Tuha wa alaykum with sakina wal waqar. Come to the prayer with sakina, tranquility, wal waqar, and decency, honor. Don't come to the prayer rushing like it's you know you're like you're robbing a bank. Wallahi, the way that some of us come to the masjid, it's like there's a it's running down as if there's a fight or something. Come to the salah peacefully, calmly. He said, "Ma adraktum fa sallu, wa ma fatakum fa atimu." What you make of the salah, pray, and what you miss, make it up. What's the big deal? No, no, I want to rush to make it. No, come carefully. If you make it, you make it. So if you don't want to miss, come early. Let that be a lesson to you when you miss a, ruk- a rak'ah, when you miss part of the prayer. A lesson next time, don't miss it. 
Not that you go and you, uh, uh, you, you compromise on the salah to make up for your lateness. The salah is the most important thing. Compromise everything, but don't compromise your salah. The next point, not following the imam when the person arrives while the imam is sitting or prostrating. So some people, they come into the masjid, they see the imam, he's in the sujood or sitting positions on the, and he's after, he said, I missed the rak'ah anyway, uh, I'll just sit and wait. Why does he sit and wait? Wants to see, and if the imam is it's his last rak'ah, he just wait for him to finish and he make his own jama'ah. Or he says, I've missed that rak'ah anyway, why should I trouble myself going down for nothing? Balash. Right? It's not counted for me. In terms of that, I'll make it as a rak'ah. I just, instead of troubling myself going down and then getting up, I just wait for him to get up so I don't, you know, laziness. We just mentioned the hadith. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? That when you come to the salah, whatever you make, pray. And whatever you miss, make it up. Some people that find the Imam in the final tashahud, he's about to say, Salaamu Alaikum. That's how the prayer is nearly finished. Khalas will just, comes with his friends, we'll just pray a second jama'ah by ourselves. Not allowed to do that. You make it with the imam even if one second before he says salam alaikum. If you do that, if you make any part of the jama'ah, inshallah you will have the reward of the jama'ah. Why do you get so lazy? Ah, oh, they're already down, it's not counted for me. Get, make the intention that you're making the jama'ah, inshallah you'll be rewarded for your sujood and you're sitting in sujood even if it's not counted as part of your rakah. Why do we have this laziness? It comes to our salah. So, <clears throat> waiting for the imam, if the imam is sitting or prostrating, instead of uh, joining. It, it is preferred and more correct for the person who enters the masjid to join the imam in any position he may be in. Whether prostrating or otherwise. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِذَا جِئْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ وَنَحْنُ سُجُودٌ فَاسْجُدُوا He said, if you come to the prayer while we are prostrating, then prostrate. Let's say, well, I missed the khalas, I wait for them to get up. Or I want to see, maybe that at the end of the prayer, I'll just sit it out and then I'll pray by myself. No. Even the scholars, they said that if you miss the jama'ah, that you're not allowed to pray another jama'ah in that masjid. Why? To teach you a lesson that don't be late to the jama'ah. So even if you come with a group of brothers, don't pray jama'ah in the masjid. Pray everyone individually to teach you a lesson. And then what happens is well, a, br- a group of brothers praying jama'ah And brothers are praying sunnah Brother doing tasbih There's going to be a lesson Everything has to stop waiting for these brothers And then it becomes a trend It doesn't matter I'll catch the second jama'ah I'll catch the third jama'ah I'll catch the fourth jama'ah Some messages are like that by the way oh, I miss this one I'll catch the next one i catch the next one No It should be only one jama'ah and the one who misses the jama'ah should be a discipline for him not to miss it next time. So if someone delays the prostrating, he deprives himself of an act of worship that is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as we said, some people they just wait. The imams in sujood are oh, to waste. It's not a waste. This is a worship. Don't deprive yourself of this worship. The Prophet sallallahu said, إِذَا أَتَى أَحَدَكُمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَالْإِمَامُ عَلَى حَالٍ when one of you comes to the prayer and the imam is in any position, then let him do what the imam is doing. If the imam is in sujood, be in sujood. If the imam is sitting, see, if the imam is in the final tashahud, join. Whatever position he's in, they say, oh, I've already missed it, what's the use? No. Join the imam. Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu said, لا أراه على حال إلا كنت عليها. قَالَ فَقَالَ إِنَّ مُعَاذًا قَدْ سَنَّ لَكُمْ سُنَّةً كَذَلِكَ فَافْعَلُوا Mu'adh رضي الله عنه he said I do not see him referring to the Prophet ﷺ in any position except that I follow him the Prophet ﷺ said surely Mu'adh has initiated a sunnah for you so I follow it so he has said something that is corresponding to the sunnah see what Mu'adh said that's what you should be doing Okay, another point is actions that distract the person from prayer. This is proof that the person prefers the worldly life over the hereafter, obeying his desires over obedience to Allah. 
amusement over remembrance of Allah. And that is a loss, an evil consequence upon the individual. Allah the Exalted said, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu la tulhikum amwalukum wala awladukum an dhikrillah wa man yaf'al thalika fa'ulaika humul khasirun O you who believe, let not your properties or your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah. And whoever does that, then they are the losers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised the believers when Allah says in the Quran, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ Men who neither trade nor sale diverts them from the remembrance of Allah nor from establishing the prayer. This is any action that distracts the person from prayer or causes them to be lazy in it, such as staying awake all night. So some people that stay awake all night, then when it comes time to the salah, they're so tired and lazy and they become any restless in their salah. So they have preferred, they'll stay hours watching football, hours watching movies, hours playing shadda. But the prayer, they just want to finish it quick, get it over and done with. What have they preferred? The amusements and the enjoyments of the world life over the salah. Some people, they'll miss their salah altogether. This is not permissible because that which leads to the impermissible is itself impermissible and Allah guides to the straight path. We ask Allah's guidance and steadfastness. Of the things that are distracting in the salah is fidgeting with clothes or watches during the salah. You find people as soon as he starts to pray, everything becomes annoying to him. He wants to fix his hat. He wants to scratch his head. He wants to do a manicure on his nails. He wants to fix, you know, he gets hot, takes his jacket off. He gets cold, puts his jacket on. He zips it up, zips it down. You know? Plays with his beard. Looks at... Hmm. Wants to open a hairdresser salon. the such way. Everything. You see him before the salah, after the salah... Nothing, no, nothing wrong with him. In salah, it's like he's got ants in his pants. Everything is, is, is annoying to him. Can't stand straight. One leg, the other leg, cracking his knuckles, cracking his toes. You see people doing that? Dancing, what like dancing in the salah? Looking. What's this guy doing? His phone rings. His, uh, his keys, puts them in his pocket, takes them out of his pocket. No, because they're distracting. Like, This is all part, when you're in salah, it's like you're dead. That's really what salah is. Your salah is your journey to the afterlife. Nothing's important anymore. If I'm dead right now, am I going to be worried who's going to call me, who's not going to call me? Am I going to be worried about any of that? Wallahi, when you die, your phone's going to ring and people need this job done and people need this, that. and The wife's waiting for the groceries. If you're dead, everything will stop and the world will go on. Wallahi, no one needs you. No one needs you. In your salah, you have to block every thought of the world away from your mind. Think as if you are dead and think if you're dead, what am I going to be worried about? Am I going to be worried about this sale and this customer or this person or this? Wallahi, you're not going to be worried about anything. That's how we should be in our salah. It's your time to think about your death. To think about how you are going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similar to Salat al-Jum'ah. Salat al-Jum'ah, you're not allowed to talk even if someone says salam alaikum to you, you're not allowed to respond to their salam. Someone puts out his hand, don't pretend you don't see him. You don't see him, you don't talk to him. So they just give him salam so he doesn't get upset. No, make him upset. And after salah, teach him you're not allowed to give salam. Don't in salah say, salam alaikum brother, but you know, in, in Juma, I can't. You won't teach him a lesson like that. I remember when I was young. 
I used to come to the masjid. I used to see my uncle in the in the masjid. I used to get excited to see my uncle want to come and give him salam, and he used to block me. I used to get freaked out. I, he doesn't even put out his hand. Keeps his hand to himself. Doesn't even look at me. Doesn't even respond to me. I know he can see me. I know he have my hand. He doesn't say anything. And then after the Juma, he would see me and greet me, and he said, "In Juma, we're not allowed to give salam." Isn't that a more that lesson sticks with you more? But if you let it slide and let it slide, and then you're not going to teach anyone anything. Whether young or old. Wallahi, today in the salah, a guy is phone ring, in the khutbah, calling, hey, hello, uh, wallahi, no shame. And he's not a young guy, ignorant person, old man, should know better. In the khutbah, in the jama'ah, answering the phone, uh, I don't know what he's saying, going on in conversation, not in the wallah, I'm in jama'ah, close the phone. When you're in Jum'ah, your phone should be off. Even if it rings, off straight away. I don't care who it is. If there's an emergency, then don't go to Jum'ah. Stay at home and attend. Your wife's about between life and death. Something, your doctor, is an emergency. Someone's going to die if you're not there. Go. But don't come to Jum'ah and, 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 and be distracted. Same thing with salah. We're not saying that in salah you come and wallah, there's your, your, your kid's going to you know, go to the kitchen and pour the, there's a pot boiling water and he's going to pour it on himself. No. Deal with what you need to deal with. Free yourself up. Free any distractions as much as you can and come to the salah. Nothing. That's it. Block the world. This is why even when you come to salah and you need to go to the toilet, which is more important, Go to the toilet. So that when you pray, you're not thinking of anything. If you have food and the food is ready, should you pray or eat the food? If the food's ready, eat the food. If the food has been served, eat the food. If the food's still on the stove and it can, you know, it's still heating and you can eat it later, pray and then eat. But once it's served, eat. Why? So you're not thinking of the food. Thinking, Allah, I just want to pray quickly, Allah, the food's going to get cold. Leave it on the stove, leave it heating on the stove. Pray and then eat, or eat and then, uh, and then pray after. So why did the Sharia, uh, why did our Prophet Sallallahu tell us this? To show us the importance of Salah and to make Salah what it's for. So fidgeting with your clothes or watch during the Salah is part of the things that are a common mistake. This action negates the focus and devoutness in the prayer and the proof for focus and devoutness in the prayer has been mentioned in the fifth affair. We've mentioned it before. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa forbade rubbing pebbles during the prayer. You know, when people in their Salat al-Jum'ah, they look for, they start to get distracted from something. You see the thread in the carpet. Or in those days, there used to be, you know, the natural earth. And they used to have little pebbles or rocks start picking the pebbles. You see people, subhanAllah, they get distracted with anything. Focus. In the Salat. In the Salat al-Jum'ah. The one who plays with the pebbles... He negates the focus in the prayer. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِذَا قَامَ أَحَدُكُمْ فِي الصَّلَاةِ فَلَا, يم, فلا يمسح الحصى فَإِنَّ الرَّحْمَةَ تُوَاجِهُهُ When one of you is standing in prayer, let him not rub the pebbles. Don't touch the pebbles. Because the mercy of Allah is facing him. The movement may increase to the extent that it is no longer appease as though he is praying and thus his prayer will be invalid. Wallahi, there are some people. They move so much in the salah. You look at this guy. Is this guy praying or not? Wallahi, I've seen it. People in their prayer, they'll be moving. Put their phone is out. The key is picking up. I don't know. Playing with their hat. Playing with their, you know, their jacket on and off. Wallahi, you look at him. Is this guy praying or not? Then all of a sudden, Allah Akbar. He's doing a this is a, if a person's movement is so excessive, it doesn't look like he's praying, then his prayer is invalid. You know, some of the madhabs were very strict. They say, you're not allowed to do more than three movements. If you do more than three movements, your prayer is invalid. Okay? And they got this from an no excessive movement in the salah. So what, what do you determine to be excessive movement? Some of the madhabs, like the Hanafi madhab, were very strict. In they said three movements and you're out. Other madhabs I say, no, it, it depends on the situation. It, and it's not, there's no proof of exacting putting, but you should put that in your mind. It's, it's a good thing to go by. Don't do 
three movements maximum. If you, uh, I've got an itch, خلاص, that's it. Now I get another itch, resist it, resist it, resist it until you can't anymore. Yalla, save it. It's like the talaqs, you know. You don't want to use your talaqs up because you don't know. Maybe one day you need them. So you don't use them unnecessarily. All right? Because if you use them heck for something that's fifty-fifty, then when you really need it, then you're stuck. No, your wife is gone forever. Anyway, so the same thing with your itches in your salah. Think, is it really worth it? I've only got three. If it's not worth it, leave it. Okay, maybe you're going to need it later. It gets really bad later. Good, good example. Yeah, Allah, inshallah, you understand. Closing the eyes, this is the last one, inshallah, we'll take. Closing the eyes during the prayer without reason. Some people, when they pray, they want to close their eyes. There's no, necess no necessity for that. But they think that will give them more khushu'ah. It's not from the sunnah to close the eyes during the salah unless there is a necessity for it. For example, there's just so much distraction and you try to concentrate so much distraction and just close your eyes just to help you focus momentarily, then you're allowed. Okay? But just as a sunnah, as something you think that closing your eyes in salah it's going to give you more khushur, it's not actually from the sunnah to do that. Closing the eyes during the prayer is hated, it's disliked, it's considered makruh by the scholars. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah he said, closing the eyes during the prayer is not from the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu The scholars have differed over whether it is hated or not. Some said it's makruh, some said it's, it's just, it's better not to. Imam Ahmed and others stated that it is hated, it's makruh. And they said it resembles the actions of the Jews, while other scholars have allowed it without hating it. They said it could be more likely to bring about focus during the prayer and focus and devoutness is the spirit and distinction and the intent of the prayer. The correct viewpoint is, if opening the eyes does not infringe on focusing in the prayer, then it is better. So if you're opening your eyes in the prayer and it's not distracting you, then it's better to open your eyes. But if there's a lot of distraction and closing your eyes will help you avoid that distraction because you try to block it out in your mind as much as you can, sometimes it's, over, it's overwhelming, and close your eyes for that time, then it's okay. So he said, if opening the eyes becomes between the person and focusing in the prayer due to something in front of him, such as a decoration or ornaments or something that would distract his heart, then he is not hated to close the eyes at all. The viewpoint that in this case it is recommended to close the eyes is closer to the principle of legislation and the intent of the prayer than the statement that it is hated and Allah knows best. Okay, so... We'll leave that inshallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Unless there's any questions or comments about what we've spoken about. Yes, ma'am.